Now for a movie rant break, One Up presents a movie rant break. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the movie rant break. Got a great episode today with a returning guest. I got Jonathan Levitt, producer of the main fun guy fest in the building. So, I'm, Johnny, hey man, I'm here. You're here. You're back. You were here last year. Uh, yeah, same. T- pretty much the same time, I think. Right. I think it was in March. All right. But I didn't put the episode out till later because I was trying to make it more. Uh, have the episode come out closer to the date of the the festival. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um. But today, last time we did mushroom stuff in the midst of. Uh, movies and shit and talking about the festival this episode we're actually going to be talking about fear and loathing in las vegas so it was directed by terry gilliam screenplay by terry gilliam and tony grissoni todd davies and alex cox it was based off of the hunter s thompson novel also titled fear and loathing in las vegas uh, it was produced by Layla Nabulsi, Patrick Cassavetti, Stephen Namath, starring Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro. Cinematography, N- Nicola Pecorini, Pecorini. Edited by Leslie Walker. Music by Ray Cooper. It was released back May 22nd, 1998, with a runtime of 118 minutes. Budget, $18 million. Box office, $13.7 million. Uh, brief breakdown. It's about Hunter S. Thompson, who in the movie is called what's his name? Duke, Raul Duke, I think is his name. Raul Duke, that's his. And Doctor Gonza is uh, Benicio del Toro, uh, but he's him and his uh, Hunter S. Thompson, aka Raul Duke, is going to Vegas to cover this four hundred motorcycle race circuit thing that's being uh, taking place in the desert. He brings his lawyer. Uh, Dr. Gonzo and they bring a fuckload of drugs and they just get churnt and try to he tries to work while he's in Vegas and cover some events and yeah it gets lit uh, reception of it IMDB gave it actually I'll bring those up at the end it's kind of interesting what some of these other outlets rank this movie uh, yeah so before we get into this you, I, you hit me up about we, we had some issues trying to schedule this kind of we had some weather things and whatever whatever but i asked if you had watched the movie again and you said i suffered through it again <laughs> and i didn't know what that meant so can you elaborate on that before we get into this because i was kind of curious yeah i didn't want to disappoint you i just it's i you know i'm not a, I'm, I'm a huge like, I, i'm surprised because i i've always enjoyed terry gilliam's work and 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 certainly the the acting was f- funny and and uh true to form but um I think my challenge with the with it is that the the exploration of like of substances and, and how people utilize them and how they get glorified and glamorized in terms of these kind of movies um, I think cheapens the experience. I I I, I hate the idea that um, the way people interact with these chemicals is done in a way which is so. Uh, is portrayed as being so destructive and so um, problematic, you know, and in some ways to kind of th- you know, think of this as either great literature or as great movie making or as great storytelling. Um, it just doesn't make the cut for me. It's just, it's movies for like frat dudes who just like to celebrate, you know, getting blasted and doing things that they have to apologize for at some point or, go to court for damage it's, control uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> so it's not it's just not that interesting like i don't i don't need to sit around watching um you know someone else's or experience someone else's psychedelic trips it's just not it's just not that interesting right everybody has can tell tales about the the, the horror shows and the monsters and the battle on demons while you're under the influence i'm like so to make me sit through a movie you know to watch that um it, it it offered nothing to my life, I guess. I, that's <laughs> so I respect that take because we actually we had touched on that last episode where 
we I was making the distinction that films that have drugs in it and heavy drug usage in it are poorly represented. We talked about that and how they glorify or it's just not how shit goes down when you do drugs. I don't feel that way with this movie. I feel this is classically funny as more so to people that have had pulled all nighters and have done many different types of potions and concoctions throughout the night and, and how that might pan out. And I, I was convinced that Benicio del Toro and Johnny Depp were on drugs. And I usually am never convinced like when people act drunk in movies, I'm like, they're not drunk. There's a couple actors I've seen pulled off, but I thought this actually conveyed some, they're wild ones, you know? And I thought, they acted well and it seemed authentic almost. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't criticize their performances. I think I, I, I'd criticize the writer of the material, Hunter Thompson. I mean, he, he um, you know, to, to his credit, he, he kind of helped facilitate a, a new way of uh, t- telling stories, you know. That, um, and, and then on the flip side, he interjected himself into the middle of these stories, which uh, has quickly become a, a framework for uh, lack of credibility as far as you know mainstream media goes and trying to understand who's telling the truth and who can actually document things in a way which speak to a reality. Uh, so he's got a lot <laughs> he's got a, he's got a lot of things that um, he owes an explanation for and, and, and I think some of that's just the right in itself. It's just not it's just that not that interesting. as a writer, uh, for me, you know, you I like folks who who leave you with uh, the, the way they use language uh, in a way which you know has like leads a profound impact on me. And uh, none of his stuff has ever done that. And and the movie itself is just I just feel like it could disappear and, and nobody would suffer as a result of never having seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. See, you know. I have a different take on it because I just appreciate its standaloneness, and I'm sure some of it's fictitious. fictitious. But I like the little pocket it's in where it's just telling the story. It could be a little fluffed up, which is fine because uh, that's Hollywood. I mean, it's just going to happen. But uh, I just feel, especially at, with we talk film in, in the more recent era, just so many films are just, there, there's very few films, you know? And I'm not saying this is like an epic film, but it's one of those simplistic, enjoyable uh, eccentric, unique films. I know that was a lot of words and adjectives, but it, it's it's a unique film that I really appreciate because it's got that inner monologue and it's telling this story. And it, it also has a cool way they do in the film where they're telling it uh, with the flashbacks, with the recordings that he has. And that's how he, that's how I took it is how he would be able to recall things in great lengths is because he's recording with his tape recorder. You know, he's recording all the events. That's how he can hash them out and figure out what actually happened, you know, because it, it would be hard. I, I, I'm always hard pressed when, when people try to retell stories that they weren't writing in the midst of or they're just trying to recall a previous event because thing your memory is not what you think it is. You know, it's very easy to, to change details. But him having that tape recorder and stuff made me – there was a, a – a way he was able to maybe keep things accurate. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, just, I don't know. There's nothing in my knowledge of Hunter Thompson that would um, make accuracy uh, something that I would ascribe to him. Yeah, he seems like he's full of shit. Like, I've seen some <laughs> of his shit. Like, but I fuck with it. Like, you can't... Like, this kind of... The way I look at this, too, is you have to have be immersed in this in that world to some degree to even pull off a fictitious version of that. You could not have written that story unless you had experienced things similar to that. Oh yeah. No, I I mean I think with his the amount of chemicals he put in his in his body, I'm pretty sure he experienced all that and more, you know. It's just like I said, I don't the, uh, listening to other people or watching other people live through their psychedelic experiences or their uh, chemically induced experiences is it doesn't offer much to my life. And, um, that's fair. Yeah. It's always over the top. Like, cause I've done everything we can talk about. So like, uh, away from just acid mushrooms, DMT, like some other things too. Like I've done a lot of things and had 
strong visuals of things. And then, you know, there's a lot of substances people claim to see visuals, and I'm telling you, you you don't. You know, where people see, they say they see fucking unicorns. I'm like, okay. You don't think so? You don't think there's... I think they're full of shit, because I've done crazy doses. And I'm not saying that your vision and things are misleading, but the only thing I've seen things that are not there is with DMT. Like, wholeheartedly, like, whoa, that's not real. Or it is, and it's not here. Huh. I I think, I mean... I think um, I know. I've I've seen things that that I've seen t- two different realms of of the universe, or, or multiple parts of the universe under the influence of psychedelics. You know, because I've I could you know, and, and it includes the classic ones like I'm able to see a tree breathe. I I, I know? see that like I, movement and things. Yes, you know, like things wiggling and like breathing, but whole living things that aren't existing <laughs> i just i i just don't and, th- and that's the thing in film sometimes they'll they'll have a cartoonized version of a unicorn after someone has taken some lsd or mushrooms and i'm like that's just yet again a bad representation that's not what happens and it does mislead a lot of people i think into taking the drugs they think oh my god i'm gonna see these like cartoonized unicorns and like people get kind of shook when they go to take it because it's not like that per se but, but, but well but it, I mean, I say it is like that sometimes for people, and and that doesn't include me. I don't have, I haven't had a, a wide variety of uh, psychedelic experiences that included large scale, you know, uh, hallucin, you know, hallucinations, you know. But I would not discount that that that's the experience of a lot of people. Um, they're gonna draw down from their psyche uh, memories, images, you know, thought patterns. They're gonna access things that they didn't know were there. Um, so the idea that someone's going to access the image of a unicorn, which is so pronounced and heavy in this culture, uh, what's, I don't what's think with it, that? I don't. Think, <laughs> Are we seeing like, unicorns at a lot of levels of that? You know, it's it's a, you know it's a, I think it, it it had a reemergence with uh, in was it Harry Potter where uh, unicorns existed and they were the. Uh, Voldemort eats their blood. Yeah, and then you can't. I, don't, I think they had incredible like regenerative powers. I can't. I have to ask my daughter to get the specifics on this. Oh, I, you can just ask me. I know. All right, there were creatures. Wasn't there creatures who ate unicorns? Yeah, like if you're on the brink of death. Yeah, and there was like no other option. There was like a. It was a cardinal sin to consume unicorn blood, but it would keep you alive right. long enough to like do your bidding. So, so I'm sure that brought it back into focus. Plus, you I think mean, it was Potter? I see. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I saw this funny thing about uh, unicorns, right? Uh, like this meme. It was, it was. It was touching on the fact that like unicorns aren't that far off as far as if it could be real or not because giraffes exist. And I thought that was a good observation because giraffes are way gnarlier and different than uni- a unicorn. Is a horse with a horn? You know, giraffes this long neck, spotted, crazy looking motherfucking. Whatever the fuck it is, giraffe. You know, it's just kind of funny. Yeah, we'll I don't think I don't, I don't. I think these mythical creatures, you know, that we that are have been passed on through generations. You know, I imagine there's a kernel of something there at some point that you know stimulated that conversation in people's minds about this. You know, and so maybe it. But it's like telephone tag. You know, where it starts and where it finishes. You know, might not exactly be accurate. Uh, That's but, like dinosaurs and dragons, right? Yeah, yeah. Like they they call them dragons, but then they add this element of fire to them, which is unlikely, but who knows? Um, but yeah, so this movie, like uh, this, you talk about storytelling and changing shit. I, I just, I think, although this film had so much chaos, I appreciated it. But I thought it had good storytelling. I really did. And it, the pacing was kind of on point too. Like it would break and then catch you up on some events that had happened and you're, I don't know. I just, I understand how people don't connect with it because it's very obscure. And if you haven't lived at all in that lifestyle, it's, there's a huge disconnect, but anybody that's been a little bit degenerate, you can kind of connect with it. You know, the all nighters, you're just, you're in, you're, you, you find yourself in places you wouldn't expect around people you wouldn't want to be around typically. And you got some other, we got a friend that's maybe on one or many things and is becoming a problem. You're trying to calm down then you're turned up and they're not. And you're like, where the fuck am I? Um, I thought the execution of it was really well done. It's probably the best 
drug taking movie representation I've seen, in my opinion. Yes, there is some extra stuff in there. Um, but they, they go all the way down where they even he's consuming adrenochrome, which is heavy shit. Um, and that's when he starts seeing like the satanic shit, and there's all these little breadcrumbs about, you know, dark shit. He got it, he allegedly got this the adrenochrome from uh, a child predator, and like he was har- allegedly harvesting pineal glands from these kids. I don't know if you caught that dialogue. There's a dialogue in there where he's kind of explaining where he got the adrenochrome from. And he's talking about chewing on the gland. It gets like, it's like, if you don't know what he's talking about, then it's confusing. And you just kind of like, what is he talking about? But if you know what he's talking about, you're like, oh shit, that's kind of intense. So that's the other representation in the film. Where it's like, he goes to the most extreme shit. And the adrenochrome is a, a chemical that's allegedly harvested out of children, they say, in the pineal gland. And it's supposed to invigorate and do all sorts of interesting things that I'm not, I can't confirm, but it is like the most taboo drug out there because you harvest it out of humans. <laughs> Have you not heard about this shit? Uh, may, perhaps I've chosen not to uh, spend much time focused around it because I, um, so I can't exactly say, I can't point my <laughs> finger and say I know a lot about that. And, I don't and, either, and, but like I'm aware of, if you've heard of it. I, I believe it's somewhere in my memory bank. There is a, uh, yeah, okay. it, it sounds familiar, but beyond that, I'm at a loss, you know. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> the, but it's just that there's a dialogue in there that, goes on for maybe like 90 seconds when he's starting to really geek out. He mumbles out. a lot. It's really hard. It's you, but <laughs> yeah, especially if he, the, he says, they say adrenochrome like three or four times. And if you miss it at first, you don't know what they're talking about. And then he, he goes to explain where he got it from. It's from a child predator. And he's, he says the child predator. Uh, he never did that. He's not guilty. And that <laughs> he alludes the fact like kidnapping kids and maybe getting it from the kids is where he's getting it from. Allegedly. It's a dark little moment, and that's why he he's like mumbling on the bed with Johnny Depp's character, and like he turns into a demon, and like it just doesn't. Again, even it's it, a lot. It, it it just bores me. It's like I don't want to, <laughs> it, it, like you know. There are so many there are so many like demons out there that need to be battled with. You know, as as far as what's in in front of us as as people and as communities, I'm like the. To, to spend money producing art uh, with uh, li- severe limitations. As f- I mean, again, that's just my opinion, and that's thankfully, you know, uh, we're not all in lockstep on how we feel about art, you know. But for, for me, this one just didn't, doesn't mean anything, and it's nothing that I'm going to, I would recommend to anybody or, or say, you got to watch this. Um, his art, doesn't inspire me to share it with other people unless, you know, unless it just has to do with, Hey, this is what uh, are the worst kind of excesses and abuses you can, uh, have as far as a relationship with, um, medicine, natural medicines, chemicals, substances, whatever, drugs, whatever you want to call them. Like this is lowest common denominator stuff, you know, why celebrate it? Why, you know, cheer it on, you know, instead, why not like, utilize resources that are put into things like this to show folks uh, the power of altering your consciousness, you know, and finding ways to do it that aren't so destructive as these. Yeah. And it's, I think that the the satire behind it is appreciative because that's the thing too, is the tone is really funky in the movie. And that's why I'm saying. If you haven't done some heavy mind altering drugs, this tone of this movie is going to throw you way off. You're like, what the fuck am I watching? But I just, I think it's funny. Like, the movie's funny. Like, the t- the tone I don't think is supposed to glorify. I think it's supposed to make light of the ridiculousness of how people act on things. And to kind of like, I don't know, just... Like, like for instance... Benicio, Benicio del Toro's character, I laugh like the whole movie. I think he's so fucking funny. All the way from the beginning to the end. Hit the, the lawyer, uh, uh, Gonzo. He, he, and he allegedly gained 40 pounds for the role. But just in the beginning when he's like, medicine, medicine. And he has like pulled over and he like has to snort some shit when he's in the car. 
And then they pick up Tobey Maguire, which that's a funny little, his character's hilarious. But he's just driving and he says, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just admiring the shape of your skull. Like just little one-liners. So funny to me. And then there's like that tub sequence where he's just geeked the fuck up. And just that interaction between two people on like LSD or anything heavy. That's it's just there's so such a disconnect and it's it's comical because it's doesn't need to they it's escalated where there's like weapons involved, so it's a little extra, but nonetheless, I just connect with it and I, I think it's just kind of funny how the tone is with the movie and I appreciate it. I just it's like a it's a it's a funny movie to watch almost to watch these people just kind of lose it. it, it. It had it, it maybe because the combination of the the chemical experience and the location are just it's all ugly. Like for it's me, supposed it's, to be yeah. the I think it's like this is not a pretty situation, and I like that. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I I, uh, I like the lack. Of, I can appreciate the lack of beauty, and and I can appreciate you know the shadows and the bo- bohemia and all that things. Um, the kind of the kind of culture that celebrates either that kind of like excess, you know, as a, a for playtime, um, and you know the, the 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 economics of gambling and that kind of culture. I'm like, it's and kidnapping. It, he like it, kidnaps. It, yeah, cool it's, girl, it's just like boy. it's just nothing that I, that I think people should um, spend their time. Uh, interacting with it's just it's got nothing to offer like i think it, it's lowest common denominator stuff you know about the possibilities that exist with us you know uh, whether it's movie making whether it's um exploring you know alternate realities or or deep consciousness whether it is you know building uh communities that aren't you know just filthy with with uh the excesses of capitalism and and bank economics and uh yeah, there's a lot of powerful interests and all that kind of stuff, you know. I, I respect your take, but as your attorney, I advise you to. <laughs> <laughs> that's just so funny. Like that's what I'm saying. Like I, 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 and I think with Hunter S. Thompson, I think a lot of people take him too seriously, and I think that's why he almost gained a lot of clout because they're like, "What the fuck is this guy? What is he talking about? Is he for real?" And I kind of, I just, I fuck with the tone of the film and just. I don't think it's trying to do anything except tell a story. And that's why I like it so much. It's not trying to do anything except this is what happened. And then, like so many times there's like movies with agendas and shit. And it's just this one, it just doesn't. And it's fucking nice. It's granted a disconnect if you're unfamiliar with, with the, the, the lore, if you will. But it's just when I watch this film, the subtleties in the film where they just he go Johnny Depp's character p- pulls out the fucking a dollar bill and it's rolled up like he just snorted something. You just see it real quick, but just like the little subtleties of that, uh, the the outlandish conversation that they have between one another that clearly doesn't make any sense and it's completely ludicrous. And it's just like even to Johnny Depp's reaction to when the coke flies out the vial in the car, his reaction is so household to react if coke flew out the window. He's just like, ah! like he does this weird reaction, and I just the whole film I just felt that these motherfuckers were telling the story in a way that. Uh, Seemed authentic, and I I just appreciate the simplicity of it. You know, I'm not looking for the like this movie's gonna change your life. If you like ridiculous shit and have been fucked up in your life, like go fuck with this movie. <laughs> like I don't know, there's a reason why it's got a call following. You know what I mean? What? It was. A, I mean, it was. A, it was a new kind of. He you know he presented a uh, a, a new kind of journalism. You know where where he put himself at the center of it. You know, I think that that when people change the form of of art, it, there is something to be celebrated. You know, and just in that, you know, but yeah, uh, it's different. It doesn't have to be like anything. Just different. It's unique and different. And I think sometimes people resent shit like that. And I just, you know, we're both artists, and it's one of those things. I think you just have to tip the cat. Like, word, dude, that's cool. This is a cool little story. It didn't have to. You don't have to try to change the world with everything that you write and do. It's like. I resent it. I resent the fact that I mean, I got to be honest. I resent the fact that that folks like this can access this kind of capital to create what I think is half-assed art. When mm. when there are you know people who are creating stuff that's much more significant, and much more groundbreaking, much more important, much more varied, um, and those folks 
aren't given these kind of resources, you know. So I, I do get pissed at crap. I mean, for me, crap like this because I thought you liked this. I thought, <laughs> that's why I picked the movie because I thought you said you liked that movie. <laughs> no, no. That's, I'm glad you don't. I guess. No, I just so I you know I think I'm, I'm always as a you know a creator. I'm always I am. I harbor like deep resentment against the flow of capital. You know where it goes as far as creators. You know because. Uh, I mean, none of it comes to me. Maybe that's my first voice. For none of it comes to my partner, who's a fantastic, you know, creator. None of it comes to the the folks that I've known along the way, who are all create, creating stuff with new paradigms, new ideas, new visions, um, and and much better art uh, that that's 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 that it's meaningful and powerful and in all directions too. You know, than this classic Hollywood, like. Romanticizing of drugs. Yeah, like you know. And it sounds like you're a fucking hater, though. <laughs> well, I, I, there's a lot in this world. I have, I would absolutely place myself on the side of I can't stand it. You know, I can't. I would not argue that. But it's, it's, it's because I'm constantly disappointed in the available resources to uh, all the the wonderful creators and and paradigm shifters and and reality changers that that can access that kind of funding. You know, and have to struggle. You know whether it's for uh, a lifetime to kind of be able to bring out these wonderful books or these wonderful uh, musical efforts or these this theater or this uh, visual art or this video art or you know the stuff that transforms people's lives or this stuff just it's entertainment you know and there's a little bit of a need for that in this world today. It's not much more than that though. I appreciate. Your take on this? You'll be happy to know the budget was eighteen million. Like I said, the box office is thirteen point seven. There you go. You, you're smiling. You're like <laughs> you fucking hater. You're a fucking hater. That's funny. I I think it's hilarious because I thought you liked this movie. That's why I said let's review Fear and Loathing. But it works out that you don't. I like opposition. Uh, did, so the Tobey Maguire's character funny as fuck, right? It was. It was. He complete. <laughs> you <yeah>. showed up. <laughs> uh, that was that was well done. It was. Uh, I'm just admiring. Sorry, I'm just admiring the shape of your skull. That line is so classic. Uh, what did you? So what was going on with the the predatory situation with Lucy, right? Um, and there was, I think, a tie into LSD. You know, Lucy. I think that's a thing, right? And but the, at the end, there's like blood on the wall, or was it ketchup? Like I, I was wondering if the, he was admitting to a crime because <laughs> there was blood everywhere. But then he said mustard at one point, so I wasn't sure. I don't know. Trying to trying to filter out what was real and what was hallucination <laughs> is beyond my mental capacity for that particular film. Yeah. So I have to plead ignorance. I talk about shit that's not real. The lizard scene though is that's probably my favorite scene, where he's in the bar and everybody turns into lizards. Yeah. And then tell me about the fucking golf shoes. And they're like, huh? <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> Maybe I'm just some piece of shit that likes this movie, though. Like, you're making me feel bad about liking this movie. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody should. Everybody's got their own taste. I, you know, I, so I don't begrudge anybody else their guilty pleasures. I've, I've sat through, you know, uh, my share of, of um, questionable media over the years, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, don't you have a play that you wrote that glorifies cocaine? <laughs> no, uh, hippo- no, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I think, I think it uh, in the context of the the musical, it's it, um, it's it's one person or one char- a couple of characters celebrating cocaine. It's you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's the reality. I don't, I don't think I, I think cocaine, like every other pharmaceutical, it's available or other every other stimulant or substance or. You know there are purposes, you know, for them. I'm not. You can't just kind of use a blanket and just uh, cover everything with the same, you know, the same identity, you know, so to speak. You know, so cocaine. Yeah, cocaine has had a, got a bad <laughs> rap because, I mean, if you lived through the '80s, you'd know why cocaine got a bad rap. You know, the 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 end results were not overall positive. You know, but again, that comes with the culture. I mean, for instance, you know the before that cocaine becomes cocaine, you know, it, it's, it's, it's coming from cocoa plants, which you know, are used in other parts of the world as, you know, morning time coffee. 
right? So it's that little stimulant that everybody needs to kind of do the hard work for the day. Um, so it's just really how it uh, generally with these kind of things, it's how a culture utilizes them that causes the problems, you know. Uh, and, you know, in our culture, we're trying to uh, constantly uh, reheal all the disconnects we've had with natural medicines. Um, you know, for, for years, we battled with the one around cannabis. Right now, we're trying to move forward, you know, things like psilocybin. Um, Is cocaine next? And I, I think, well, I think, I think cocaine should be, or at least the plant itself, people should have the ability to create and harvest their own stimulants. <clears throat> I've got no issues with, those, with that at all. Um, you know, because, again, if you want to go by the, the, you know, the reality, we live in a culture that is uh, built upon stimulants, you know, very, very destructive, destructive stimulants. And we've created space in our culture where people can utilize those things legally. You know, uh, anybody who's a parent knows that sugar <laughs> is, That's crack, is okay. that, you know. <laughs> anybody who's grown up in New England knows that coffee is, a, is a, you know. Anybody growing up in Maine knows that, that alcohol is the kill, you know. Yeah. All these things are available to people. And, um, and then they you know, create these streams of destructive uh, waves, you know, that, that, that come behind. And, um, but we want to live in a world where people have those options. We feel more comfortable in a world where people have the right to self-destruct and to um, experience their own connection with, with plants and medicines. Um, and I think that's something to be celebrated. So I think if, if cocaine is something that people want to uh, use as part of their lifestyle, you know, I, I have no issues with that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to be a consistent part of your lifestyle, but, you know, we all pick our poisons. Facts. Those facts. Uh, so hater Johnny over here. <laughs> uh, do you know anybody that's like Gonzo? Have you ever met anybody that resembles that character? Because I was like, I've never met anybody that's such a beast in so many different ways and reckless, but also like... Clever and I, competent. I wouldn't. I don't think I would be able to tolerate too much time in that person's presence. That's just agreed. You know, it's just <laughs> that, that's that's singular energy. You know, they're off on their own trip and they're not they're not looking to interact with with people in some sort of framework that's going to end up being positive for those other people. Yeah. You know, so wh why waste your time? That's fair. But I had to ask if you knew anybody that was like that guy because I was like, do people like this exist? <laughs> like, I, God I, damn. I can't say they haven't. I haven't crossed paths. Like, I haven't. Crossed, years, but, I haven't but maybe I blocked them out if they. If they yeah, that type of energy, I might have just scurried away real quick just because that <laughs> shit is toxic and noticeable. Uh, there was a couple other cameos I thought was interesting. Cameron Diaz. She was the reporter. She looked hot as ever, as always. And then there was... Uh, Penn, the magician? Yes. I saw him in there, yeah. which I thought was funny, because that was before he was a thing. It was 98, so I don't think he was a big magician at the time. Just yeah, he's been, Penn and Teller has been part of the conversation since late 80s. Oh, right? for real? Oh, it yeah. makes sense that he yeah. would show up then. And and, okay. uh, and part of the Vegas scene for at least, you know, the I last figured, 30 yeah. years. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so what's, do you know anything about, I think they call them opera cigarette holders those extensions <laughs> do you know anything about those like what like why they started they started i don't know if it was just trendy or they thought it was healthier but like why did they go away you know i don't know they definitely reek of the 70s you know yeah uh, via the via the 40s maybe i can't i'm not yeah, they had sure the, the, they had the super long ones like the black stick ones yeah that chicks used to rip on i'm pretty sure and then they get like uh, Giant Depp's character, Duke or whatever, he had that little plastic one, yeah. a little extension. I didn't know if you had any. I don't. I, I, it's funny. I, I, I don't have any idea. Maybe they're filters. Maybe they're. I think it was a, an additional filter to it that yeah. it was somehow looked at as more healthy. But I didn't know if you had any run ins or like knew about them. I don't hang around with too many classy people. And those kind of seem like the things that classy people would be drawn to. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so what's your, uh, do you have anything else to hate on this movie for? Because you, uh, you have the floor. What's up? 
I, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't carry, it just doesn't carry a lot of weight with me and, but I don't begrudge folks the opportunity to, you know, figure it out for themselves. Um, That's fine. What, so I, 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 on the show, we, what ends up happening after we talk about the film, I, you rank it one to 10 to the 10th place. So I'll give you the scores of some of the bigger platforms and what they were saying about it. All right. And then you can, not that I'm trying to sway you, just so you can. IMDb, 7.5 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes, 50%. And Metacritic gave it a 41%. That's and about what, accurate right there. What? So what, what score are you going to give like, it? I'll give it a four. You're going to give it a four. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hit it with an 8.1. Well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to live with that. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I said what what I think about it. I think it's I think it's a great movie. Sometimes you just want something different, you know. And I think this offers that. It's not everybody's flavor. It's okay. Doesn't mean it's not good. You can be a hater. Doesn't mean it's not good. I'm not, I'm not fighting any battle here. I'm 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 okay <laughs> with I'm okay with the difference of opinions. No, it's good. I, I I respect your take on it. I get it. But at the same time, I think the fair rebuttal is like it's just this little story over here. Like you don't have to put too much merit in it, you know? It's like when you watch like most movies, it's like what what are you getting out of it outside of wasting your fucking time? <laughs> I want when I watch it, I just want those two hours back. <laughs> well, you don't have to ever watch it again, and you let everybody know how you feel about it, so the world knows. So you can check that off your bucket list. So people, you know. But let's talk about something that you do like, right. and that is the main fungi fest. The third annual one is happening this year. Congrats! Yeah, yeah. on doing that. I was a part of it on some level last year. I was there. I had a little spot and met a lot of people attended the burlesque that I didn't have. I never had been to one of those, and it was actually really well done. I enjoyed it. And, yeah, it was good vibes. A lot of people from all the country showed up. It was a good time. You did a good job. Yeah. Yeah, it's happened. I have notes. It's happened again this year. (laughs) Uh, From Let's see, Friday, May 17th through Sunday, May 19th at uh, University of Southern Maine in Portland. And, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be a breakthrough year. I mean, the, the, the amount of attention... It's already come in about the event, the amount of folks who have already, you know, pre-registered, the amount of uh, people who are want more information. It's it's going to be a breakthrough year for the event, and it's going to be a breakthrough year for this issue, I think, as well, where you're going to start seeing a lot more people um, talking about it, writing about it, thinking about it, and considering what um, we can do to improve access to uh natural medicines and to the uh, give us the ability to alter our consciousness in search of something <clears throat> better than what's what's going on right now um and we're going to have you know workshops we're going to have panel discussions keynote speakers presentations demonstrations there's going to be live music live art which is different than last year last year there was live music at the burlesque yeah, but there wasn't more than that, right? No, this year we're gonna have uh, a, a couple of different areas centered around a couple of different buildings, and there'll be stuff ongoing in all of them, um, including a lot of content that's gonna be available free to the public. Um, but um, again, we've I think we've got like close to sixty to sixty to seventy workshops. Um, I had one of the one of the guys that's gonna be that rewild main Zach. Yes, he was on the show a couple. A couple of weeks back, yeah, months ago, he, he's going to lead a couple of um, tours, foraging tours around the campus, so which is going to be a, a cool experience for folks. And, and certainly, if something if, if you yeah you come with your kids, that would be a great thing for them to enjoy. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the content is definitely aimed towards uh, people are eighteen plus, um, and it you know includes things like you know ecology of conscious. Um, Grain spawn, um, mycology lab skills, uh, dyeing with mushrooms, uh, paper making with mushrooms, um, ketamine, conversations on ketamine, uh, conversations about, you know, uh, psychedelics and parenting, uh, and conversations <laughs> around um, uh, decriminalization of mind, body, and soul. Um, conversation about uh, uh, we have our keynote um, 
we have three different themes for the event every year, uh, all things fungi, plant-based healing, and evolving consciousness. And, and this year for evolving consciousness, we've got Ignacio Rivera, who's going to uh, give a presentation called From uh, Fear to Freedom, uh, and to talk about what, um, both on a personal and a kind of a, uh, a global level why we um, get resistant to the concept of transitioning. You know, what, what, is it, what are the hurdles that come up when we talk about trying to transition to something better, uh, both personally as well as like, politically and globally? And uh, yeah. uh, we've got just, just uh, people coming from all over the country for it as presenters, as attendees, um, all sorts of wonderful entertainment, sound healing. I don't know if, if folks out there have ever been to um, large-scale sound healing sessions, but they're, you, know, you want to talk about a an alteration of your consciousness. You, you come out and sit through one of Jim Doble and Forrest Weston's sound healing sessions at the event. And um, I think I was at... They do those in the morning? They, 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 were, they were doing them last year. They did them all throughout the day, and then they did the, the closing ceremony that we finished off with a, a large-scale one. Um, there'll be vendors there. There'll be artists uh, creating on site. Um, there'll be hands-on activities for people to participate in. There'll be shared meals. Um, people can get housing right on site um, in one of the dorm rooms. Oh, cool. the, the meals will be on site. They have a cafeteria there as well as some food trucks. Um, and yeah, you're going to have people coming together for who, some folks who just want to kind of know it's in and outs about how to grow their own mushrooms, whether those are medicinal mushrooms or whether those are, you know, for culinary purposes, it, it's, it doesn't matter. You're going to learn how to, how to grow mushrooms. You're going to learn about plant healing, you know, how to, you know, different herbs work with each other and how to, um, handle all the things that come at you in life as, you know, in ways which give you control and power over the outcome and, and put the, the, the tools and the medicines available, you know, to you. Um, yeah, there's going to be just great conversations, uh, building community, um, so that moving forward, we can continue to support some of the work we're doing with the legislature around trying to uh, actually get psilocybin uh, decriminalized here in the state and give people the ability to kind of get uh, trained as trip guides and help provide that support for folks who want to explore psychedelics. See, that, that's always been a concept that I don't agree with for some reason. I just think it's, I don't want to say unnecessary, but I just think it can be detrimental to a lot of people when you're having uh, people haven't indulged in psilocybin or LSD for that matter. Um, it can be a lot. And I get why there could be having someone there to help, but it could also cause a lot of problems where people can be worried what that person's thinking and like judgment and just being uncomfortable, I guess. I don't know. I, I think a lot of folks to, to take this leap of faith, you know, for a lot of folks, it is going to be a leap of faith to, to, to say to them, hey, take these mushrooms, they're going to make your life better, but they're going to alter your reality for a certain period of time. A lot of folks are going to need that that hand holding, you know. And, and, and not to cut you off, but like I, if it, if it helps people make that leap of faith and it they, it'll help their life change for the better, I'm for that. But I just think as like a industry, I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah, well, I, hopefully it doesn't become an industry. I think it I, will. You know, <laughs> I think that yeah, the reality is when when you put stuff into the regulatory body, which is what you do when you create legislation and laws in this country, you do end up creating these um, in industries of some, and we saw that certainly in the cannabis world, you know, that are built around <coughs> fulfilling regulatory, you know, requirements. And it is, there is some absolute truth in the fact that uh, it's a shame we feel the need to do that. Um, but I think people who kind of operate in this realm in the world of laws and legislation always have one foot in the door of reality. And we know that without given folks who like our legislators who always worry, they don't want to be, you know, they want to going to constantly worry about the impact of the decisions they make. And the governor is going to worry about the impact that decisions that she makes are how we're going to, they're going to impact her reelection. They're going to want in place something that gives at least the illusion of, you know, some element of control. And that it's, it's awful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trait of our culture that, 
Uh, people spend endless amounts of time trying to control other, money. other, other people's uh, lives, you know, and, and, you know, there's some positive things that you want to, certainly as a community, you want to come together and figure out some common ground that we can all live under. And then there's the, where body autonomy st- starts and where the, the government, state, corporations, medical professions, whatever, they need to back off and let people figure out, you know, their own truth, um, you know, and, and what works for them, whether it has to do with their relationship to vaccinations, whether it has to do with the relationship to um, what they put in their body for stimulants, what they do in terms of their relationship to their body and how they use it in sexual, in sexual ways, you know, this is nobody's business, you know, except those individuals and how they want to experience this life. Uh, so, yeah, so, so anyways, <laughs> the, the Funky Fest is a, is a gathering of, of people who want to uh, ask questions, you know, and want to push forward. If you, I think if you're the kind of person who is experiencing the world right now uh, with some level of discomfort um, as far as how we are, if we are moving forward on either a, on a personal level or on a, on a, a political level or a global level, if you feel like something's out of balance, you know, then this is your, the place you want to be to connect with people who I think are feeling a lot of the same things and we are busy trying to carve out uh, new ways of understanding consciousness, new ways of understanding the way we relate to each other, the way we relate to the planet. Um, these are the kind of questions that people are going to be talking about and thinking about and exploring at the Main Fungi Fest. And it's a good place to start that journey for a lot of folks, I think. I think so too. And I, I've been happy to have you on the show and meeting the people that I met at the festival last year. I mean, that was the, the takeaway. I think it was just meeting a lot of people that were looking for answers and some people that had maybe found some answers and were looking for some more, you know, and just people that are trying to like have a good time and just be, I don't mean to say free spirited, but <laughs> this is kind of a played out term, but kind of, you know, and just kind of, trying to find their way in, in this little community and in, in this, uh, this idea, you know, and I think this idea is bigger than just, you know, legal, not legal or good times, bad times. There's a lot of things outside of just psilocybin. There's a culinary aspect too, that is really intriguing. And the benefits that, that can help you have a better life too, is something worth checking into and just going and, uh, doing some of these walks, nature walks to, to, to see some of the natural things around you that can be utilized is kind of cool. It just shows you appreciation of earth, you know, and just the world. And it's cool. I, the, the festival is cool. And I, I'm, I think what you're doing is super dope. The mushrooms are a, a great starting place for, for, you know, because just <clears throat> what, how they, how they function, how they operate, um, how they connect. Uh, they're a great, uh, place to, for people to start, uh, thinking, you know, and, and, uh, um, uh, get rid of the, the worst, the worst, uh, place you can, you can be at is to think that you're, you're knowledgeable to think that, you know, you know, right now there's, there's, there's a lot of people who claim that the people, you know, spend lifetimes trying to sell that, that they know the truth, you know, about all of it, you know, and be, it's what I find enjoyable about the Fungi Fest and people I think who are part of this community is they're folks who start the conversation off saying, we don't know. Let's try to figure out. Let's start asking questions. Let's start having the conversations. Uh, it's, a, it's a much uh, healthier way to, I think, go through life. And I know it'd be a, we'd be a healthier people if we could all start there, you know, rather than pretending that we know. We already know the truth because we fucking don't. If you think you do, you're you are, you know, loudly proclaiming your ignorance. You know, I mean, not to get into religion, but I think that's like can be an issue sometimes with that type of folk. It's like the we have it figured out. It's fine. I'm like Ugh. that confidence is uh, off putting. Yeah, in like every context for me, it's, uh, it's terrifying too. You know, uh, people who who, you know, if you if you look at. Um, where the darkest times have been in, um, as human beings, as human cultures, you'll recognize some similarities. You know, and one of them is that those people have found some truth and they imagine that that's the way everybody has to live. Mm-hmm. And that's when the horrors begin. You know? 
Cults start and shit gets weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, genocide starts. You know, it, it, it goes it, it goes far deeper. You know, and 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 uh, yeah, and they put these poisonous fairy tales into our, all of them. Put poisonous fairy tales into our heads, uh, and people spend lifetimes trying to purge. You know, or just come to terms with and like live by while having guilt. You know, I mean, if we're just talking about some like the theology based uh, religions, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I remember growing up, there was a point where I was, you were taught something at a very young age and you, it's kind of, you're limited with different ideas and possibilities. So it's kind of like the one that's reigning the most prominent in your head. And then there's like this guilt uh, that I remember dealing with and just like rejecting the doctrine or not rejecting, but just like questioning and, trying to be logical and just not also be played for a fool. Like, I don't want to sign up for something where like at the end, it's like, this was, you were wrong, <laughs> you know? And I, and I, I know there's that element of faith with anything that you kind of have to, you know, take it on. But at the same time, it's like, this still all stems from people that wrote things that were humans that were dudes that <laughs> like, I don't know. It just, the you know. we call them the revealed religions. They're the ones you've got to watch out for. And, and within those revealed religions, <clears throat> you know, the, you have to, you really have to watch out for the fundamentalists. Uh, cause those are the folks who, uh, who there's no wiggle room, mm. you know, you are either with them or you're dead. You're you know, condemned. Those, yeah. Even, those, those are the fundamentalists. You find them in the Christian world. You find them in the Islamic world. Um, across the board, you you find them in people whose 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 political ideologies have become, you know, religious, quasi religious. Whether it's you know followers of people like Stalin or you know uh, North Korea's Kim, whatever his name is, and stuff. How dare you? Yeah, so so like you got to watch out for those. They're da- they're those, they w- those fundamentalists who who have you know have no regard for the concept of one of the things of 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 living in a world where. Uh, diversity is celebrated, and I, and I mean that in the biggest sense of the word, as well as the smallest sense of the word. That, that one thing we've learned from studying evolution and 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 paying attention is that uh, the greater diversity that exists within a species, you know, the better chance of success that species is going to have, you know. And so so it's important that that when you find people who are who want everyone to ascribe to the same worldview and want everybody to sign off on a singular God of their choice, um, those folks need to be fought with every conceivable ounce of energy, you know, no matter how much they want to justify it and they want to point to their relig- religious nonsense and their texts and their, and their gods and their preachers and their theologians, you know, they're lying to us and they've left us with a world that is so combative uh, and so uh, um, un- uncognizant of how out of balance we really are, you know. So, so yeah. Well, nothing, yeah, nothing good to say about them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they, the biggest uh, thing that I see that's consistent through these type of individuals that you're referring to is they weaponize the doctrines, generally. And that's You get people emotionally and spiritually into things, then you can skew it or use it against them and then start controlling them. I mean, they've been doing this since the beginning, ever since motherfuckers couldn't read. (laughs) You know what I mean? So that's a great, that is, that's a great way to (coughs) weaponize in the doctrine. That's what they do. Uh, And I hear you. Uh, um, Let's not get too morbid and dark with it. (laughs) I I fuck with it, but I was going to ask you something more positive as far as like, uh, for this year's festival, what are you most excited for as far as like maybe changes or like just something going on that you're just like, oh, this is going to be fucking sick. Like, we're going to, ha- one of the things we're uh, going to have is a co- um, community conversation on, on Friday uh, where we're going to, one of the things that's happened now with kind of an emergent psychedelic community as well, who's going to provide oversight, right? Who's going to watch out over, over people who are, place themselves in positions of vulnerability in some way, shape, or form, right? We're always trying to do that as a culture. And in what context are you talking about? Uh, um, so essentially what's happened is you've got a whole new movement of, of people who are utilizing psychedelics. 
and are, are making them a part of their life or going to folks looking for guidance or uh, to be part of group journeys on psychedelics, you know. So you've got a lot of people who are uh, going to create structures to facilitate this and make money off of this. Um, who's going to provide oversight when you have people in, vulner- you know, in, pl- in spaces where they're vulnerable, you know, which when you're under the influence psychedelics, you can be vulnerable. So you're talking about the guide situation? Yeah, well, and it just, it's just kind of more as a general theme. Like, so how does the community self-regulate? Because, you know, the last thing you want to do is bring in the state to create some Agreed. sort of right, you want a community to be responsive to to the to the elements in that community that are um, taking advantage of people, ripping people off. You know anything that's kind of a violation of what you know we imagine is a good use of these new therapeutics. Um, we want people to have a, a a group that's kind of paying attention to those things, so that they're helping to steer the conversation and helping to train people in ways which. Um, you don't find that any that kind of abuse happening, you know. So it you, sounds like you want another group, like a government type thing. You, you, like it, it sounds like a government group that would regulate this type of thing. Well, what we don't, what, <laughs> and again, so the need is there. What we don't want is another government group. And so the idea is to put the early on in the development of this emerging community, finding ways to vision beyond what would be the traditional answer to that. Like there are new ways to think about these questions, uh, things like this. Because you do, I do want to live in a world where a community is watching out for each other. I start there. You know, some people don't, but I do. So I want to construct answers that, that respect that and provide ways for community to have that oversight and that keep people accountable. You know, and I don't know how that works because it's, it's been used in other cultures in different frameworks and different ways to handle different situations. We need to learn about those. And we need to construct those. And we have those in place so that when people do start, you know, making psychedelics a part of their, you know, a regular, regular part of their life, um, they, there are people that, that have, are trustworthy. There are people that can, you know, there are mechanisms to hold people accountable, to protect people. And, um, and I think now's the time to have that answer. We don't want to ask the government to do it. So the community needs to step it up. Maybe um, all the, when, when the new, because once it gets commercialized so to speak and it becomes legalized maybe maybe there some of the stores have to have a i don't want to say shaman or just like a representative that can be like a Q&A kiosk or something i don't know <laughs> i think you want to find ways that don't involve coercion right and you know any anytime you can find an answer that doesn't involve coercion you're in a better place as far as success you know so you have to build into the culture from the get go expectations you know you have to teach people at a young age how to understand psychedelics you know you know what the different how you can go what are the different ways that people can explore it what are the different options you know where the locations that and and have a a way that people can share this information enough so that people can feel comfortable from their peers you know see i i just oh all in all i don't agree with that concept like like I'm trying to, so I was like, oh, maybe there's be like a representative that can like be a, a beacon of answers for people, but like I don't see a way that it would be not overbearing and just over the top. It's like, a it's a mindset. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a early education of people about what 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 are your responsibilities as a as a, either a person who's going to explore these things or a person who's going to interact with people who are exploring them. Teach people, you know, give them a culture that's full of like strong affirmation for doing the right thing, you know, and make sure that people are held accountable. One of the things that the reason so much abuse is taking place in in place, it, it, you know, what we that have kind of come out over the last ten to fifteen years, right? All these different subcultures where all this incredible abuse was taking place, it was because nobody was held accountable. In those those communities, were not holding themselves accountable. Whether it's, it's just, the Catholic Church. <clears throat> whether yeah. it was Hollywood, nobody in those communities were holding anybody accountable. So when this emergent psychedelic community starts, you know, coming of age, you know, it should have strong expectations about holding people accountable. I just, that, that, that word accountable, I'm just having a hard time as to seeing like what this would look like. Cause I just have seen the commercialization of psilocybin already. Cause some of the air pockets in the U S have it. And just some, some companies already in the area are starting to try to monetize it and they're like selling microdoses. I forget exactly what these motherfuckers are doing. 
But I hate seeing some of these people that are monetizing it because I'm like, I, I I get what you're getting at, but like for me, there's there's part of this like I don't want to say there's like wonder or there's like there just needs to be personal accountability. And so that's that the word accountability. I get where you're coming from. And there needs to be this expectation, like be responsible, you know, like drink responsibly, they say, you know, it's like eat mushrooms responsibly or, or what have you. But it's more accountability. It's the accountability really is about the, the practitioners who may be like either counselors or trip guides, people who are. And yes, people who are definitely making money off this. Those those are the people, people who need accountable, not not. I'm not saying that people who are going to go and explore their consciousness. OK, so you're money. saying on the the business end of things, if you will, needs the accountability. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Okay, because I thought, okay, yeah, because yes, that because I feel that way. Where, like I said, there was some there was some organizations that were at the festival where I just they try to give me free shit. I was like, I'm good. Like I just don't. I see some of these people and these pockets of people that they are. I don't. I don't know what it is. They're just corny. And they, and I they act like they're these spiritual people, and they they sell shitty drugs, <laughs> you know what I mean? And they act like they're good drugs, and they act like they're open minded people, but they're egotistical and uh, they're cunts, and I don't like them. And I, because I've been doing mushrooms ever since I was a teenager, I've always stood by them, you know, and defended them, and then to see like some of these people monetize it and like kind of ruin what mushrooms are and some of these other substances are infuriates me. Like I actually, I'm like, fuck you. Cause you don't know shit. Like you're these, like these little micro dose group hippie people of the new age. I hate it. Like, Oh, we just like, they've like never done a macro dose in their life. And they're like, Oh, mushrooms are so great. I just micro, which is fine. But there's like this group of people that I've seen that I just don't like where it's like, they don't, they don't know what they're taking almost. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. I just don't like it. But it's like this commercialization of psilocybin that bothers me and the people that are like taking advantage of the new opportunity to monetize and make money off it. They're, they're just like kind of spearheading it and going to be the face of the industry. And that irritates me because I'm like, this is not these people are whack. These are not these shouldn't be the mushroom people. God forbid they're already the, like some of the weed people, but now oh they're gonna be mushroom people too, because these people suck. Like I just I it irritates me. Like I see a lot of it. It's not just one group. There's a couple little organizations I've seen, and it's just like annoying. And I'm like I I just there's something about them that I just it's cringy and they're corny and I don't like I don't like it. I mean, truthfully, there I mean there are, there are charlatans. All over, I don't know what that all, means. You know, frauds. You know, folks. You know, folks who are putting on an act. You know, I, th- I guess that's what I feel. They're but, fraudulent. I'm like, you don't know but, shit. But I don't. But I, don't, I. But it's also kind of a grand statement. A lot of these folks, you know, are passionate about what they're doing, and but they also want to, like everybody does. Like you're passionate about your music, but you love to get paid at the end of the day for that music, even though that's your spiritual practice right there. But you also have to eat. You got to pay rent, and you got to take care of your family, your community. You know. A lot of these folks are no different than that, you know, and I, I know there is a natural tendency to kind of want, you know, when, you, when things start getting monetized, you know, some, some level of the beauty kind of gets drained from it, but I'm a performer and I, I'm, I'm putting my effort out there to create something for someone else, you know, the respect that I want back is, uh, you know, applause at the end of the, at, 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 you know, and then I want a paycheck for it. You know, because I'm putting my a lot of my hard earned time and sweat and equity into that. You know, these folks shouldn't begrudge that. Now, you want to talk about the scale? You know, the problem comes with the scale of the economics. If you've got a bunch of, you know, we we went through this with cannabis when we wrote the legislation originally to create the medicinal marijuana system. The envision and what we wrote in was these small mom and pop stores all across the state, which would con- con- bring this to people, make it available to people, and the economics, the money would stay in the community at a low level. You wouldn't have these multinationals coming in, all these, right? And the legislature fucked that up, and they changed the law after we had passed it in a certain way. You know, same thing's going to happen with the mushroom world. You know, you're going to have people who are going to come in who have passion about it, and they're the ones who push it forward because they know what they're doing and they're invested in it. 
They're going to want to make money because the only way you can continue on is if you make money off of what you're making. And then at some point, some of them are going to get touched by the, you know, the calling to become bigger and better and greater and, yeah. and, and more and more, right? And, and other folks are going to be turned off by that. Everyone, it happens with, like, every industry, grocery stores, fucking hardware yeah, stores, everything, dude. Yeah. I mean, and I stand by the point, I'd rather have it be legal than not. But I guess the if, in wrapping up what I'm saying where I see it's almost like hipsters, that I'm seeing and the, the the hipsters of the fucking like drug world now like they're the face of drugs like I've been selling drugs like since I was a kid right like allegedly like like making this possible for you motherfuckers you know what I mean and like you're now you're coming in here which you don't know shit you don't know shit not you, but like these motherfuckers. I'm like, you little hipsters, you don't know shit. Like, you never picked up a pound of anything. Like, don't even, like, and had to drive through states to bring it back to make some money. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, and then you see these hipsters, like, I'll try our microdose. I'm like, oh my God, like, you're so whack. Think how those, think how those OG cannabis people felt 15 years ago when the laws changed. Oh, I'm made. sure. They were hating, hating, hating the new energy coming in because it was, it's that kind of energy. Oh, it's, I trust it. Entrepreneurial. You know, here's, here's, here's something that we enjoy doing and being around that I can make money off it. Boom, I'm there, right? That's, it's a, it's, it is a natural trajectory. And I wish, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It, 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 up, again, what causes problems is when the economics become larger, when the scale of, of, of who's controlling the capital and who gets the profits you know, goes from people living in a community you know, on a small le- scale level or people, or people outside that community who are just taking their cut every quarter. That's the problem. You know, I hear you. you know, if, if if we could just limit that and, and if people in this country could learn to appreciate like mechanisms on wealth, uh, accumulation of wealth, if we could all finally accept that that's OK and that this world does not need billionaires, it does not need billionaires at all. We don't need billionaires. We need to take that money and give it to other people because they will turn that into possibilities and potential for us. The problem with that mindset is that it's up to the people to prevent that. It's the trying to save 8% off your bananas. You go to the grocery store, the big grocery store versus the little store. Oh, cause I can save 8% off my grocery bill. Eventually that company is going to die. Same with the hardware store. Like I said, and whatever else you're when, when shit gets the big motherfuckers coming in and taking over the industry, it takes the community to not support those companies and shop at the Ma and Pa. Otherwise, the Ma and Pa are gonna die. Yeah, but you, you that's a, it's kind of an unreasonable expectation because of the rules get written to to make that difficult, you know. And it's and the one, one of, that's why that's where that's why coming together as a governing body, as a community, and creating legislation that's that's widespread. You know, that's how you deal with things like that. In our in our country, though, the, you know, when you start talking about limited wealth, you know, that's always been the thing that's been thrown up there as the greatest evil, you know, the idea that you want to set limits upon how much people can accumulate in wealth. It's fucking common sense. It's common sense. If you, if you're, unless you are one, the 1%, it's common sense. But they've, they have built such a powerful fairy tale, a Her- the Horatio Alger myth of like the self-made person that they buy into it and they, and they, you know, I think once they reach that level, they imagine themselves as better than the rest of us, smarter than the rest of us, more capable than the rest of us. You know, and they convince people like like who are who who will never ever accumulate wealth that the, what's really important is that I always have that p- tiny possibility that I can. You know, can that, what can accumulate that kind of wealth, and that becomes more important than guaranteeing that everybody has health care, guaranteeing that everybody has housing. Guaranteed that everybody has opportunity and education, you know, guaranteed that people can live fulfilling life. All that doesn't matter. All that we all we've been told to hold on to, right, is this dream that we're gonna be one of them. You know, and I we, get what you're getting at. And it's it's a it's it's a it's been a huge detriment to to moving forward, I think, as a as a country. That's tricky. It's just been getting extra funky the past half decade too. Oh, yeah. With just everything, um, and it sucks sometimes. But yeah, it's it's a. I when I get in conversations about society and the the climate where shit's at, it's just everything's connected. 
but you have to start somewhere. And like, this, I think the starting point is so challenging and like where people just get turned off because it's like, where do we start <laughs> with trying to fix some of these issues? It's like, I, I, I like to believe in my head that everybody has some sort of energy that's drawn to something specific that could help benefit the world, whether like someone's into legislation of one topic and someone's in some other topic and like someone's into like cultivating natural, whatever. like if everybody just, I feel like everybody's destined to contribute in a unique way, but I just feel like sometimes people just don't even follow that inclination because it just seems so dissatisfactory and overwhelming or something. Does that make sense? Yeah, it is overwhelming. It is, it is, it doesn't have <coughs> a, a tremendous satisfaction to it, like to fight these battles, no. you know, but the, the starting point is to start. And it's never going to change. There's no people can listen to great philosophers forever and great pontificators. You know, wow, fucking you, words. You just have to, you know, you start. Start with the Fungi Fest, third annual, May seventeenth through nineteenth. Yes, yep. And you can go to mainfungifest.org dot um, org and check out all the details. And uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think people would be disappointed if you if you you know you want if you're a seeker and want to kind of. Uh, have really good conversations and meet like-minded people and community, the main funky fest is a great place to, to do that. Good. Um, I hope you have great success with it. Do you want to keep talking about the fest? Like, we keep talking about it if you want. I mean, I mean, I'm always happy to talk about it, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's given enough for people to digest. I think, I think their, their next stop is to go to the, the site. Is it burlesque? This year, we're, we're, <gasps> every year we're doing different kinds of like cultural and, and entertainment things. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna say that there's gonna be a lot of interesting things happening. If people check out the 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 Fungi Fest site, they'll see a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, they'll be but they'll be yeah they'll be uh, what is it Tony? Have you ever seen comedian Tony Nagy? Mm. She's 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 hilarious. Uh, Hill of the Earth is a performer who'll be there. Um, yeah, there'll be Sound Heal and there'll be uh, Martin Bridge, who's a talented artist who, whose images we've used on a t shirt for the last couple of years. Um, you know, speakers like Dana Sawyer, uh, speakers like uh, Jesus. You said that they can check, you have all the. The whole That's agenda, January. yeah, up on mainfungifest.org. So dot org the schedule. Who has fucking dot org these days? You just you just went org. I, well, I, I think I got the I got the org. I got the com. I got the net. We just you got the net. I, <laughs> they sell the net. God damn. They sell more than that. They, dot us. You can get it all over the place. I think I net, I think damn. I've always just focused on the the org and the com. You know, but. Fair. But the event is, and the event is is designed to support the organizing we're doing in the state, trying to change laws. So you know, it's it's not an. There are a lot of industry events out there where they're put together by people who are in the pharmaceutical industry, and are, yeah. you know, this isn't. This is about activists and organizers. Did Did you think about having it at a field, like an open field, like because you have it, you had it downtown Portland. We we had it at the um, Portland Expo Center. So originally, originally when I conceptualized it, we were going to try to hold it as an outdoor event. But, you know, as we kind of evolved the vision and we, and we also, you know, we just realized that the impediment of having things outdoors is you're always at the mercy of the weather. Um, and, and for doing to do it, the real the purpose of the event is to educate people, you know, mm -hmm. and you can't do that in, in a field in a field as, as well as you can do it in a more controlled environment, I think. OK, I've, I like that answer. That's good. That makes total sense. Because when you, I thought you were going to have a more open venue this year round, but then you get, you got the college, and I was like, oh, interesting. I would have expected the field thing for some reason, yeah. just because of the occupancy and just like, I don't know. But that makes sense. Yeah, there'll if, be, and there'll be some outside activity happening. Right, they have, a, they have a big green space in front of one of the buildings, and there'll be a lot of flow, circus arts and flow arts taking place there. So, you know, there'll be a lot of outside visual stuff and there'll be a chill out lounge where people can come in and, you know, just chill out <laughs> under big tents. And it's, it's going to be a great event. Yeah, yeah that sounds dope. Uh, OK, so anybody can check out at mainfungifest.org. Yeah, yeah. And it's May 17th through the 19th. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram as well. OK, we're out there. We're out there. Uh, do you want to say anything else to the people? 
no, nah, just just um, watch this movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, you're looking, if you're looking for something to kill, kill two hours, did uh, you want to hold? Or did you want to hold the movie? I want to like, just don't break it. I know you're getting like angry. Just try, don't snap it. Like just hold it out. Like so much you love it. Like I, I want to suggest <laughs> not spending two hours watching this movie and instead wow. um, coming to the. I don't know, when's this going to be aired? I was gonna try to button this up, but I when I say that it ends up being delayed, so I don't fucking know. I'm gonna do my best. Just email me if you need suggestions on how to spend two hours not watching Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Just uh, you should write like a little memoir me. about it. <laughs> okay, well, Johnny, thank you for on the show, dude. I appreciate it. You're an interesting individual, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk your shit, quite literally. And uh, I hope the festival goes well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No problem. Dude. So that is going to do it over here at the movie round break. We got Johnny hitting it with a four, strong four. It's a strong four. It's a strong four. It's a solid four. I'm going to hit with an 8.1. Love everybody. Go check out Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and I'll check you next episode. Deuces. <laughs>